Millions of years ago, in the distant geologic past, the violent forces of Mother Nature relentlessly pummeled our little ball of rock. These tremendous forces applied over the vast passage of time resulted in the formation of four land masses lying only tens of meters above the sea level. In our present day, these small parts of the ocean are collectively known as the Aldebra Group, which lies a thousand kilometers southwest of Mahe, the capital of the Seychelles. The Aldebra Group comprises Aldebra Atoll, Assumption Island, Astove Island, and Cosmolido Atoll, each of which has its own unique and tumultuous history. In its own separate story and vastly shorter time span, a different kind of threat, mankind, evolved from apes and sailed out to sea and over a long and often perilous history, slowly unveiled the picture of what lay out in the unknowns of the oceans. Time has been kind to the Aldebra group, which has suffered very little of this human invasion. Over recent years, these incredible landmarks have been the focus of much conservation and restoration efforts, and thus are today among some of the true wonders of our Earth, and lie as wild and remote as they had been in the distant past. Today, Aldebra Atoll, as a World Heritage Site, among its many wonders, is home to a small population of dugongs, a species on the brink of extinction. This is the story of a dream to fish the best GT destination on the planet. Keith Rose Innes was at the forefront of the first fly fishing expedition to this unique and remote section of the Indian Ocean. In the late 90s, whilst freelancing as a professional fly fishing guide on various atolls in the Seychelles, Keith came across charts of the remote Aldabra group and found these amazing looking outer atolls inaccessible and remote. In 2001, Keith started exploring the outer atolls such as Farquhar, and after years of dreaming of the Aldebra group, Keith had built up a burning desire to venture away from the humdrum normalcy of everyday life, and so brought together a group of like-minded personalities who set sail aboard the 110-foot Mike, a journey that would last six weeks and would take them all the way to Madagascar. After various stops at atolls where he had been taking groups to for years, Keith and his companions then set out to explore the Aldebra group, the most remote part of the Seychelles archipelago, lying roughly 400 kilometers from the mainland of Madagascar. Upon arriving at Cosmolido and Astov, they found what mostly appeared to be a barren hunk of jagged black rock, which was almost ironically teeming with a diverse array of life, both on land and in the ocean. They were too soon to realize that they had stepped foot on the home of the largest population of giant trevally on the planet. And after a series of sheer carnage from the resident Caranx Ignobilis, the group was in a state of humiliated defeat, but burnt into their minds was the obvious fact that they had discovered an incredible place and they would return better prepared. Upon their return, Keith immediately set to work to make this incredible place accessible to fly fishermen. After operating on various boats throughout the Seychelles, he started a conversation with Amit, the owner of a charter company based in the Seychelles, who then started the search for a suitable vessel which would enable them to take fly fishing groups with multiple skiffs on deck to Cosmolido and Asto. After much searching, Amit found a boat by the name of Maria II. Keith flew over to inspect the boat and found it to be a contender for what they needed to take groups to Cosmolido. The boat was subsequently purchased and sailed to Mahe where it was refurbished and appropriately rechristened, the MV Myers Dugong. On board the Dugong is a crew of 15, along with four Alphonse fly fishing guides, who cater for the 12 fly fishing guests she can accommodate at a time. The 
seven guest cabins situated throughout the lower, middle and main decks are spacious and comfortable and one would be hard pressed to find a better and more accommodating vessel to take fly fishing expeditions to the remote outer atolls of the Seychelles and Indian Ocean. One feature of the dugong is a large crane that does the lion's share of the work, hoisting the onboard skiffs to and fro. The four Alphonse guides take the guests out on these skiffs to explore the amazing fishing Cosmolito and Astove have to offer. Up until 2009, there were various trips to Cosmolido and Astove that were only accessible to the privileged few. Life was good until Somali pirates entered the Seychelles archipelago, which forced the Seychellois government to close access to the outside atolls. Cosmolido and Astove were no longer fishable. For five years, these ancient parts of the ocean lay untouched. Setting up an operation out in the Aldabra group is, is not very easy. You know, it's a long way out. It's the furthest atolls away from the main island, Mahe. The Aldabra group is largely untouched, so there's not much human support. Uh, you need a big boat, you need a, a plane, you need the clients to be able to fund the, the trip. And we're lucky at Alphonse, we've got a great guide team, we've got a great sales team, we've got the team together, we've got all the, the anglers together. And we managed to go out for a five week trip and it was an amazing experience. About three weeks before the, the beginning of the season, you know, we had filmed the, the show Seven Degrees South with Richard. And um, I thought, you know, it'd be, it'd be an awesome experience to get this documented. So I gave him a call and I said, you know, would you like to come out and, and film with us? So what he did is he came out for the last week of the season. The team had been out there for four weeks. The guys had already uh, racked up over a thousand GTs. So, you know, we, we thought, okay, it's a perfect time for my Cuban mate, Devin Fun and Maverick, to come out and fish with me. The trip starts with a two hour 45 minute flight out of uh, Mahe, which is the main island in the Seychelles. We fly straight into Assumption and when you get there the boat's waiting for you. The boat's taken five days to get there so everyone's ready, ready to accept you onto the boat. And once you get onto the boat we set up tackle and we get ready for a short session that afternoon. It's very important to have that first session done. Uh, test your tackle, straighten your line, test your hooks, make sure you've got it and you're ready for the next day. So fishing out in these, these atolls, you get a lot of shots at GTs, there's a hell of a lot. And uh, it's all about making your, your shots at the big fish count. And, and often when there's a big fish around, there's often a small fish around. And that's what happened to me on the first day. First fish comes up and I see a nice big fish coming straight at me, I make a nice long cast, and out of the shadows comes a little guy and grabs the fly. And uh, that's fishing. These islands are so full of these little these guys. Swimming around, you're eating anything that comes about. That's the last thing you'll see. I believe if you're going to catch the big fish, you need to concentrate on the surf areas. You know, the more hostile the area, the bigger the fish generally. You don't often get a lot of shots, but you get uh, some shots of some big fish. And on day two, took a nice long walk with Richard. We walked probably for about 10 k's, and we came across this area which looked really nice, and we staked out for a while, and lo and behold, there comes a nice big GT sitting in a, in a hole. I made the cast into the wind. It didn't see the, the flight first, and it turned around to, to have a look at us. And almost as if to say, you know, go somewhere else. It didn't, uh, didn't eat the fly, swam slowly away and into the distance. With GTs, you've got to make it count, and that day I didn't. When we got to the amazing atoll called a stove, uh, we arrived there on the slower tides, which was great. And often on the slower tides, there's always water on the flats. 
and uh, these GTs are swimming around on rays. And uh, when they're on the rays, they often turn, turn dark. And from a distance, we saw this GT in the surf line. I called Richard and we, we headed off after this fish and walked into the water. And you know, they don't, they don't move very far. They stay in a similar area. They're feeding on top of the ray. And we, we, we waded up to this fish and uh, I made a nice long cast and the first didn't see the, see the fly, so I picked it up again. I made another cast out again and he came. And he, he, he almost wanted to eat it, but he didn't want to eat it. So he followed it all the way to the rod tip. So I kind of had to give it like a two second pause as he ate the fly. Oh, yes! Nice fish. No, he's trying to cut me off in the shallow water. Yeah. So I guess to stay as close as you can. And it was an amazing take. And that was the fish of the, of the trip for me. You know, uh, spotting a fish from so far away, quietly walking up on the fish, making the right cast, stopping the strip when it's the right time, and then striking the fish. It was incredible. The GTs are dirty fighters, so often when you hook them, they try and cut you off quite quickly. So you've got to be quite robust in your fight. Tight drag, putting a lot of pressure, low rod angles. And after the whole thing has happened and you finally got that fish in close by and you pick it up and you hold this trophy up and you look at this amazing fish, you know, it's, it's a, the, best, the best part about the whole fight is putting that fish back in the water and, then, and watching him swim away. I think the main reason why the, the GTs are at these atolls is the incredible tides. Um, the water can fill up from your ankles all the way to your neck in half an hour. And what happens is that the water fills up from the outside as well as the inside of the lagoon. And when it comes over the apex, it just fills up with incredible speed. And I think that's why the GTs are there. Guiding out to these destinations is not always the easiest job. You know, it's an early morning start. Preparing for your day, everyone's sitting around talking about where they're going to fish. Putting your skiff in the water, getting all your kit ready for the day, making sure your guests are all ready. Getting on the boat, going out for a full day out there, you know, walking, working towards the tides, making sure that you, you're sticking to your plan, putting your boat in the deep water so that when it gets, gets low tide, you're not getting high and dry and stranded for your next spot. And it's, you know, it's, it's physical. It's, 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 a, it's a wild environment. On, on trips like this, we don't take any days off. It's day in, day out as the guests come. Uh, leave the boat, the next guests come in, and it's a, it's, a, it's a dream job, but it's not easy work. Fish! <laughs> it's not often that you get a chance to fish an amazing uh, destination like the Aldavra Group, and you know, fishing in a beautiful place like that by yourself is one thing and fishing with a good mate of yours um, is another thing and, and lucky enough I got to fish with Devon over the over a few days and uh, it was a lot of fun. So we've had a, a, a great couple of days on Cosmolido and it's my turn now to to see if I can go and get a big one. Keith took my guess for the day, so I'm off with Richard, so we re reunited. We've had a couple of good days on Alphonse in, in previous years. So we head out towards North Island, and it's the first time fishing there. Don't really know what to do, but it looks fishy and the water looks good. So we jump off and we start walking on the beach, and, and we find a, a pretty decent fish. It looked really big in the beginning because the, the cameras are rolling and everything is a bit over exaggerated at that stage. It was a small fish, but it was actually quite a good experience. We had to run down the beach. Richard just got ready with the camera, so we, we still a bit rusty. Ran after it as fast as we could, stripped the line out, but I've got a Leatherman and a belt and lots of spots for things to hook up. And fly line tends to find these spots very quickly when you're in trouble. So made the shot, the GT came in quite hot, he ate the fly, set the hook and, and I'm on and it's success, this is easy. Eventually got the line back on the reel and we landed the fish and to my surprise it was a little baby but I'm, I'm quite proud of it though. Not a bad one. But... 
first one of the day. So we've, we've anchored the boat up, we decided to do a surf walk. This is, this is where we're going to get our big one. There's lots of food on the flats, there's lots of other signs of GTs around, so we're going to stick it out and we keep telling each other that it's going to happen. Don't worry, hang in there, battling over the harsh coral. We saw this big fish come in, I made the shot, he ate the fly, set the hook as hard as you can, doing everything textbook, but the rod came apart. <laughs> Never give up though, even though you don't have a full fly rod, you can still give them horns. So this is most probably one of the funniest fishing stories I've been involved with. We spotted a nice GT swimming away from us. We jumped off waist deep, running towards it, doing everything that we should do. And I'm, I'm pretty confident about this. Make the first shot, not, not good at all. So bring the fly back, make the second shot, stripping as fast as I can. And the fish turns and he follows it quickly, quickly. And I'm stripping and I'm running backwards as well. Now Richard needs to keep up with my, my pace as well. And there's a big GT attacking us. So I just lost my footing and ended up underwater and tried to give him the fly again right next to me, but he just swam off with his middle fin out the water. When you're fishing out in these wild destinations, you know there's always going to be some crazy action that happens, and Richard was standing close to me and I'd held up this fish, and I was admiring the fish, and the next minute the shark starts chasing from behind. Cut, 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 cut. And uh, I wasn't quite aware that Richard was that scared of sharks, so this awful sound came out of his mouth. And before I knew it, he was on my back. And all I could say was, don't shout. Why do you shout? Don't shout. It's okay, don't shout. <laughs> you won't fight it. <laughs> the sharks on the star were quite inquisitive. You know, they swim a lot with, with, with uh, uh, with GTs and often uh, when you hook a GT the sharks turn around and have a go at, at the GT and uh, I experienced that at one little stage on, on a stove where I hooked a nice little fish and he came after it and he had to give him a little nudge with the, with the rod. Well, we saved the, saved the best for last and uh, Devon and I decided that we were going to fish together and uh, Devon being Cuban, he had a little bit too much uh, run the <laughs> night before, so we were a little slow out of the blocks and we, we pulled up to the mouth of uh, a stove, got our rods ready and as we, we got there, we put the anchor down and we saw two fish coming straight out the mouth, you know, at a hell of a lot of speed. So we looked at Richard and we knew he wasn't going to make it, so myself and Dev jumped out and uh, we started approaching the, approaching the fish. I went for the bigger one that was on the left, Keith got the smaller one, um, and, and it, it's sort of a, are you ready? and go and we put two two lines out two nice long casts and and both fish ate at the same time it was unbelievable and they were big fish before he knew it he had been cut off on the right hand rock by the so-called bigger fish and uh, i was lucky enough to hold tight and uh, i got a gt of one one meter five and uh, it was amazing it was a, a great start to the morning and uh, a start to a day that was was, was going to prove to be the, one of the best days fishing we'll ever have <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> Over the years of fishing these atolls, we've found out that you know the big GTs like to hunting in milky water and we had the perfect conditions at a stove that day. We had a neap tide where the water wasn't all the way in, we had a pushing tide and the, the, the waves was, were coming across and hitting the cliff face. So we had this nice uh, um, big colour line. This fish tried to, tried to cut us off in the caves, he went right into the... It, it is, 
sort of the worst place in the world you can think of having a big fish like that. It's just, it's unheard of. It's crazy. Oh. <laughs> He's just staying right next to the wall. He wants to go right in the cave. No! Let's go. Yeah, One meter fifty. <laughs> yes. What a beautiful fish. Yeah, the Aldabra group is without doubt the, the GT capital of the world. There are more GTs in the area than, than anywhere else in the Seychelles or anywhere else in the Indian Ocean. And uh, that's why everybody goes out there. It's, it's a place which is, is frozen in time. You, uh, there's no human pressure. Uh, the fishing is the most amazing fishing you'll ever experience in your life. But it's more than that. You know, it, it is a place which is, the beauty overwhelms you every time you go out there. At times when you're fishing, you just need to take a, take a second and stop and just look around you and see where you are. Um, the environment is untouched, it's incredible. For us, this isn't a short-term thing, it's a long-term thing. It's about sustainable ecosystems. And sending a mothership out to these uh, atolls and going out and fishing them it's not about just that, those three or four or five weeks that you're going to do it. It's the long term, it's the long -term uh, um, goal of eventually setting up a lodge, you know, a place where you can actually manage a fishery and you can keep it for many years to come. Planet Earth has some astounding and relatively unknown treasures. The four members of the Aldebra group are without a doubt among some of our true wonders of the earth. Don't hunt! No, it's In the edge of the, the color change, and off we went. And uh, we took turns, one guy putting with the boat. Uh, yeah, it was great. They're awesome, man. Mike. 
The bike is moving. <laughs> Hello, buddy. Hello. Is it techie? Starting February 2015, the new Astove Atoll Lodge will be opening and will cater for six lucky anglers per week.